Okay. Oh, good morning, brethren. A uh, special welcome to those who might be online. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath to you all. Rather than a new year, <clears throat> as outlined on God's calendar, is about to roll around once again. And thousands of years ago, God introduced a sequence of yearly observances called feasts to a group of people who were the descendants of a man named Abraham. Now God had made a promise or several promises to Abraham. And some of these observances are tied in directly to these promises. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 12. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 12, oh sorry, Genesis chapter 12. Why did I say Leviticus? Don't know. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 to 3. Now God said unto Abraham, Get out of your country, leave where you live, and from your father's house. And go to a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And curse him or curse those who curse you. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. Note that, brethren. In you shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now when God began to fulfill his promises to Abraham, he introduced these special religious observances, as you can go read in Leviticus 23. He introduced these uh, special observances to his, Abraham's physical descendants and commanded them to observe the feasts forever. But brethren, the feast actually transcended the time and place of Abraham's descendants and embodied a greater intent that, unfortunately, they never understood. Because the promise that in you all families of the earth shall be blessed had a tremendous spiritual dimension. And today, brethren, we want to look at that promise to Abraham, its relevance to us and to the feasts mentioned. So if you want a title, it's the promise to Abraham, its relevance to Christians. Let's first flesh out the idea about the families of the earth being blessed through Abraham. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, and let's read from verse 7. He says, Know you therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. If we go back to the Genesis narrative, the Bible said Abraham did what God told him. Didn't argue, didn't quibble. God told him to leave, and he got up and he left. And that act of leaving was accounted to him as an act of faith. 
in addition to another incident later on in his life. So he says, know that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Note this. So that you don't have to be physically born as a descendant of Abraham to be considered his children. Uh, verse 8, it says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen or people apart from Abraham's descendants, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, verse 9, they which be of faith are blessed along with faithful Abraham. And let's drop down to verse 13. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, the penalty of breaking the laws of God, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through him. Again, the blessing of Abraham, in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. And verse 14, uh, yes, let's drop down to verse 15. It says, now Abraham and his seed, his descendants, were, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not unto seeds, as of many, but as of one, unto thy seed. Referring to Christ. And if we drop down to verse 26. For you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized unto Christ have put on Christ. Verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one. In Christ Jesus. And note this one. Verse 29. And if you be Christ. If you are a Christian. Then are you Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. So the promise that was made to Abraham. If you are a Christian. You are considered to be Abraham's seed. Because you are now not descended directly from Abraham, but you are now, quote and similarly, uh, metaphorically speaking, a descendant of Christ. And through Christ, who was a direct descendant from Abraham, you get to be also regarded as a descendant of Abraham. So to answer the claims that the laws in the Old Testament were for the Jews, it says that you don't have to be born as a direct descendant from Abraham in order to be considered a seed of Abraham. The last verse shows that there's no such thing as a Gentile Christian. Note Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And let's go from verse 28. It says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, physically, genetically. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly or spiritually. Your descendant of Christ, as it were. And the circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. 
whose praise is not of men, but of God. And let's turn forward to Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 1, it says, I say then, has God cast away his people, the physical descendants of Abraham? No, God forbid, for I myself am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. And let's drop down to verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Again, referring to the physical descendants of Abraham. God forbid. But rather than, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Verse 12. For if their fall be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? And let's drop down to verse 16 and you can go read the intervening verses in your own time. Verse 16, it says, For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. First fruit is the raw grain. The lump is what you make from the grain after you have ground it and made flour. The first fruit is holy. And of course, the grain being more plentiful than the original thing. He's referring to the descendants who will come. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree was then grafted in amongst them. And with them you partook of the root and of the fatness of the olive tree. You fed from the nutrients that the olive tree supplied. He says, boast not against the branches, but if you boast, you bear it not the root. You don't, if you boast against them and think you are somehow superior because you think God might have rejected them. It is the root that sustains you, not the branches. And the point Paul is making here, he's using some an agricultural principle. If and let's say for our purposes, let's suppose you graft a mango there with a julie mango. Cut it, you fit it in, and you graft it. When that tree now begins to bear, it is no longer a mango there. It looks different, it tastes different, it smells different, it has acquired all of the qualities of a Julie mango. And whereas a ver might have a lot of strings that will stick in your teeth, etc., the Julie mango is now more fleshy. The flesh is soft. The seed even has the striations that you have on a Julie mango. So Paul is making when you graft something in, it becomes a part of the tree that you grafted in. It is not what it is before. If, as we say, the graft took. If the, the, the graph was unsuccessful, it will continue being what it was. But if the graph is successful, it becomes just like the original branches themselves. And that's the point that, 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 that uh, Paul is making. So that in order to benefit from the blessings, we're grafted in. In other words, we have to become like a Jew, the seed of Abraham. Now, Abraham had a son named Isaac, the seed of Abraham. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. We know the history. Uh, Esau, as Paul said, despised his birthright, which later went to Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and he had 12 sons. 
you know, Dan, Gad, Asher, Simeon, Levi, Benjamin, Issachar, Zebulun, Reuben, Judah, Joseph, Naphtali. One of these sons, Judah, produced the tribe, hence the name Jew. They came from Judah. And Christ was born of the tribe of Judah. Now, you remember, Christ was also referred to as our Redeemer. Why do you think he's called our Redeemer? In the Bible, now Redeemer is somebody who buys back some valuable item that you may have left, as in our case, that you pawned with a jeweler. You can go back and get it after a certain time. But Christ bought us back, as it were. Because we were lost in sins. And he is called a redeemer. And only a relative in the Bible can redeem an item. So Christ now qualified to redeem us because we are now considered to be the seed of Abraham. In other words, we are now Jews. Remember it says he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but one spiritually. That is what was made possible there. Now the feast that you read of in, in, in Leviticus 23. They show that God embedded a plan of salvation. Using the number seven. And seven is a number that uh, occurs in many, many places. But this plan starts with the Passover we heard today. Because without the sacrifice of Christ, there could be no salvation, no inheriting of the blessing of Abraham. Someone needed to pay the price for our sins so that we could live and not die forever. The days of unleavened bread, which follows after the Passover, they illustrate that Christ, having paid the price for our sins, requires us to live for him and live without sin as much as lies within us. We'll come back to that in a while. And Pentecost depicts us becoming the children of God. Because the Holy Spirit was first made freely available to everyone, all of mankind on that day. And let's take a look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and let's go from verse 9. It says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, dwells or lives in you. Now if any man does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not of his. So if you're, quote unquote, a Christian and you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're not a Christian. Which is why God gave the spirit to enable us to become Christians and to be the children ultimately of Abraham and be heirs to this promise. See how the process takes place? Uh, verse 9, it says, not, drop down to verse 14. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And drop down to verse 16. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of Christ, and joint heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So the Holy Spirit that was given at Pentecost and made freely available 
from that first time when Christ told his disciples to remain in Jerusalem, that was now made available to everyone. And it says, our spirit, there's a spirit in man, testifies with it that we are the children of God. Because if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're not a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, you can't become Abraham's seed. And if you're not Abraham's seed, you will not be an heir to the promises that were made. Now the next step, the Feast of Trumpets, symbolizes Christ's return for the children of God, or reaping as the Bible uh, uses the, the metaphor. And you can go and read Matthew chapter 13, uh, verses 24 to 30, and see how Christians would be guarded as if you're reaping. That's the, 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 the analogy that God uses. The parable of the, 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 the sow and the seed. And after Christ's return, Satan is bound, symbolizing the of atonement, and then Christ sets up his kingdom represented by the Feast of Tabernacles. But brethren, beyond that outline or that plan, the feasts give us a picture of how we should be living our lives, how our lives should be organized. Firstly, we must take the Passover. Let's turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. And let's read from verse 8. Now this was the actual Passover itself. Uh, if we jump up a little bit. Uh, verse 1 it says. Uh, before the feast of the Passover, when Christ knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And verse 2, he says, Supper being ended, and the devil now into entering into Judas, Judas left, Christ, uh, knowing that he did something different. Verse 4, he rises from supper. Laid aside his garment, he took off his over, and he took a towel and tied it around his waist. And after that, he began to pour the water and to began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel. And when he came to Peter in verse 6, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And he was resisting. And Christ said to him, what I'm doing now, you, you, you don't understand, but down the road you will. And let's read now from verse 8 with Peter. Peter said unto him, you will never wash my feet, never. And, here, and here's what Christ said to him, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. This is the new ceremony that Christ was introduced. If I don't wash your feet as part of this, you don't have any part with me. I drop down to verse 12. It says, so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and sat down again, he said unto them, do you know what I've done unto you? You call me master and Lord. I'm... You say the truth. You say something that's good. For so I am. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. This isn't just some fun, you know, peculiar thing that you could choose to do or not to do. You must wash one another's feet. And this is Christ's language. For I have given you an example 
that you should do as I have done unto you. Truly, truly, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither is he sent greater than he who sent him. But my father sent me, and I'm doing his will. I am your Lord. I am doing this. You're not greater than me. So I am commanding you to do this. And brethren, as I've explained uh, several times, the Passover isn't just about the death of Christ. Here's what Jesus Christ himself said. Let's turn back to John chapter 6. And let's read from verse 51. Christ says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And again, as you heard in the sermonette, not that now you're going to live forever, but down the road you're going to get eternal life. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore argued among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eats my flesh, note, eats my flesh and drinks my blood, has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day when I come. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh, verse 56, and drinks my blood, dwells in me, or lives in me, and I dwell in him. I live in him. And as I said, be brethren, we cannot dwell in a dead person, nor can a dead person dwell in us. So this could only be referring to the living Christ. When we partake of the, when we eat his flesh and drink his blood as we do in the symbols or the emblems, Christ is saying, you live in me and I live in you. And verse 57, he added this now. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, and note this, so he who eats me, even he shall live by me. Why is he telling them as the living Father who sent me? Because he wants them to recognize that, listen, this is not a myth, a mythical thing, you know. The Father who sent me is alive. The living Father. And therefore, when you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're dealing with me as a living, sentient being. So it has a contemporaneous element to it, brethren. It is active now. And after the Passover, which we take, comes the days of unleavened bread. Why do we need to observe them? Wasn't that something? Uh, aren't they merely a shadow? Well, let's suppose you go in the forest somewhere and you see the shadow of a lion. Big. Will you then say, ah, oh, that's just a shadow and walk out, let the lion see you? <laughs> Would you? Or if there are some criminals around the place and they're looking for you, and you see a shadow of one going somewhere. Will you just say, oh, that's just a shadow, they have nothing there, and you walk out and let them see you? Now you know that would be foolish. Because the shadow tells you that something real is there. It isn't just a vapor or nothing. 
Shadows reflect a reality. They tell you that something real is there. So the days of unleavened bread aren't just a shadow. They're giving us a reality and we will explore that today. Let's go to the seminal scripture that deals with the days of unleavened bread. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5. And let's read. Let's go from verse 6. Now the background to this is that there was a man in the church in Corinth who was having sexual relations with his father's wife, his stepmother. And the church allowed him to continue being a member. As Paul said, it is commonly reported that there is fornication amongst you. And such fornication that is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So even among the Gentiles, who, even as they were seemingly libertine, they would have had a problem with this. And verse 2, it says, but you are puffed up. And I've rather not mourned. You're puffed up. You are elevating yourself. You know, um, you could be deciding that in, 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 in modern language, you know, in contemporary environment, this is unprecedented. You know, you have a lesbian as your press secretary. And another transgender person as your health secretary. And another one homosexual as head of the military, governing your armies. And instead of teaching them to fight, he teaches them to recognize gender differences. And you have another secretary here approving things for equality of marriage. And you listen, and it's unprecedented, 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 unprecedented. You're puffed up. And thinking that a man having sex with his father's wife, and there are some commentaries saying, even while his father was alive, apparently they had been separated, and this man was having sexual relations with her. And you are puffed up, not more that... He who had done this deed might be taken away from you. Put him out of the church, which Paul did later. And if we drop down now to... Hmm, drop down to verse... Verse 6. He says, your glorying is not good. This puffed up attitude that you have and thinking you are so whatever because you allow this to happen, that's not good. Don't you know that a little bit of leaven will leaven the whole lump? And he's now using the symbol, symbolism of the days of unleavened bread. If I took a piece of leaven about the size of my fist and put it in a whole bowl of flour, say a five roses, five pound bag, and I what do you think will happen? Paul is telling us it will leaven the whole lump and you could try this yourself just to prove and see what will happen. Try it and see if what Paul says is true. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Five pounds of flour and this is what? Maybe a couple of ounces, a leaven. Purge out therefore the old leaven. Leaven symbolizes sin now. Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. As you are leavened, as your homes are unleavened. Why? For Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So Christ is sacrificed for us. We now have to purge out the old leaven that still exists with us. Because Christ has sacrificed for us. 
And we will see how deep these implications are. Therefore, verse 8, he says, let us keep the feast. What feast? The feast of unleavened bread. Not with old leaven, not continuing old leaven. And he, the old leaven he would have referred to here was the man having fornication with his father's wife. But whatever in your personal life, and that extends beyond just something as overt as, as, as fornication. But the old you, the person that you were before, whatever it is you might have been, you might have done this or thought that and acted this way. He said, no, that has got to change. You've got to now be a different person. Because it says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old have passed away, and all things are made new. So you have to put away everything that would have been you in the past. You can't hang out it and say, well, this is who I am, and that is who I am. No, you have to put that away. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Malice. You might have been someone who, someone has offended you. You have hostility, anger, whatever it is towards that person, whoever it is. And you might be even thinking malice. You want to do something to harm the person in some way. So he says, not with that. But with the unleavened bread. No, it's unleavened bread. Why unleavened bread? Because we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which symbolizes putting sin out of your life. And as I said, the Feast picture, how we should live our lives. Live a life with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, which symbolizes Christ, which means you must put on Christ. So purge out the old leaven, and the word purge is using again another agricultural thing, that you prune. When you prune trees, plants, what do you do? You cut the branches off that you don't want, and you discard them. So you do similarly with yourself. Look for the branches in yourself, as it were, that don't produce fruit, and cut them off and discard them. So why are the days of unleavened bread relevant? Because they tell us we must actively put sin out of our lives. We cannot just accept and be puffed up at sin. We must purge out the old leaven, purge out all sins. And here's why. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. Now we know what, for, for chap, what verse 1 says about now are we, uh, the fathers bestowed, uh, his calls us the, the sons of God. But verse 2, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it is not yet evident, it does not yet appear what we shall be, because God looks different from us. And in the same way, when a woman is pregnant, she doesn't know what the child is going to look like. You have an outline or if you do the ultrasound thing. But you don't know what it is going to look like. But we know that when he shall appear, when the father shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And note verse 3. It says, And every man who has this hope in himself, purifies himself. Why? Because the Father is pure. So if you, you have the hope of being children of God and being like the Father, it says you must purify yourself. Purge out the old leaven. Put away all the sins that we may have 
in ourselves. And let's turn to Ephesians 1, and we looked at that a couple of weeks ago. Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 1, ah, uh, sorry, verse 3. Paul said, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him, according as the Father chose us in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in him, in Christ, in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. But as I said, Christ, the Father isn't adopting us. Having predestined to make us his children. To create in us his children. By Jesus Christ. See how it now links, brethren? the descendant of Abraham, the seed coming through Christ. And if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed? But if you don't have the spirit, then you can't be Christ. Christ is now making us children of God through him, according to his good pleasure. And what the scripture is pointing out, brethren, that long ago, before any, any physical universe existed, this was the Father's intent. That we should be holy and blameless, without blame, before the Father. So, If that is the desire and the intent of the Father, which is why he created the Passover, which is why Christ died, to remove from us, as the scripture says, to remove our stains from us. So it says we have to purge out the old leaven because of this fact. The Father wants us to be holy and without blame before him. By Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. So we must always be aware of this fact, brethren. It is the Father's will that we be holy and without blame. And therefore we must purge out the sin in our lives. And if we are aware of that then we recognize that sin should not be part of our lives. Let us go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. See why sin must not be part of our lives. Get an echo here. Here's what it says. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord does Christ have with Belial or Baal? Or what part has he who believes with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God. Of the living God. As God has said. I will dwell in them. And I will walk in them. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Now he said that. When, when he had told them to build the sanctuary. But he's now applying this to us. Because again. As the seed of Abraham. If you go back to that time and regard yourself as the seed, he said to them, he will walk in them and dwell in them. And you as grafted in to the olive branch, that now applies to you. 
So there are no Gentile Christians. You are the seed now of Abraham. And uh, <clears throat> for you are the temple, that, yes, and verse 17, he says, Wherefore come out from amongst them, and be you separate. Separate yourself from the sins and people who live that kind of a life, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And verse 18, I know this. And I will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters. What did Ephesians tell us? That from way back it was the father's will that we be holy and without blame. I will be a father. He is spelling it out now. A father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters. So therefore all of these negative things that, the, that, that, that Paul referred to here. You got to put them away. And let's go down to chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises. Including the promise made to Abraham and his seed. Dearly beloved. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and filthiness of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And again, what did Ephesians say? The Father had purposed that we should be holy and without blame. Let's look at some of the examples of the filthiness of the flesh. Let's turn back to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6. Let's go from verse 9. It says, Don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, no idolaters, no adulterers, no effeminate, unprecedented, but they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. No abusers of themselves with mankind. No thieves. No covetous. No drunkards. No revilers. People who cuss you and say all kind of reviling things. No extortioners. Not just the people who might kidnap you and want to extort money, but people who engage in corrupt business practices. They buy an item and they want to sell it at five, six hundred percent increase. Profit, that is extortion. Or money lenders who want to lend you money with usurious kind of risk that at the end of the day you could end up paying uh, more than what you borrowed from them. Extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, and such were some of you. But you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. How? By the Spirit of God, which was made available when? On Pentecost. So we see how it goes, brethren. So we see some of the filthiness of the flesh. But first, but Corinthians 7, 1 said, it commands us, 2 Corinthians uh, 7, 1, it commands us to cleanse ourselves of the filthiness of the spirit also. The word filthiness is translated from the Greek uh, molosmos, M-O-L-U-S-M-O-S. And molusmos comes from a root, moluno, M-O-L-O-N-O. -O -O, and it means a stain, immorality, to defile. 
Now there's a spirited man. And the Bible is telling us this scripture here. It's telling us that it is possible to have that spirit stained or defiled. And as it says, we have to cleanse ourselves of having that uh, filthiness of the spirit. This means that this, the things that our spirit would motivate us to do will tend to lead towards or lean towards immoral or defiling actions and thoughts. Now, remember what happened in Genesis 6. It says that God saw that the imagination of the thoughts of man, or the said of the man's heart, the mind, or his intellect, was only evil continually. All the time is just more and more evil. And God therefore decided to destroy mankind. And he sent a flood that killed everybody but eight people. Because that is how their spirit had now deteriorated. That everything they did, they conceived about, was only evil. How does that reply to us? Well, do we laugh uproariously? Can't control, control ourselves, as they say, tickles your funny bone. When we hear people making smutty jokes. That's the result of the filthiness of the spirit. And I've seen, I mean, some women, you know, you make that kind of a joke and they beside themselves, they can't stop laughing. That is because of the filthiness of the spirit. Have you ever met people who every sentence they speak has some kind of immoral sexual connotation? Everything you say. They twist it to bring it down to sex and immoral sex. It is the spirit that motivates that. And that's the filthiness of the spirit. Or have you ever known someone who likes to act in underhanded ways and takes delight in embarrassing others and sowing discord among brethren or people? That's because of the filthiness of the spirit. There's a stain on the person's spirit. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And go back to verse 5. It says, For they who are after the flesh... Do mind the things of the flesh. But they who are after the spirit. Mind the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So then they who are in the flesh cannot please God. And let's drop down to verse 13. It says, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, which Spirit? The one that was made available at Pentecost. Do mortify the deeds of the flesh, of the body. You shall live. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage or slavery again to fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship, not adoption, sonship, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit bears witness, testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then... We become heirs.
how can the Spirit of God, brethren, which is a holy, a perfect and holy spirit, bear witness or testify with a filthy spirit? It can't. Here's what Jameson Fawcett and Brown's commentary said. Cleanse ourselves, as it says in, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 7.1. Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. It says this is the conclusion of 2 Corinthians with all of the, uh, the deeds of the flesh. And what we read in 1 John 3. Any man who has this hope purifies himself. That said, this is the conclusion of the exhortation that we find there. Filthiness, they said, the unclean thing. And filthiness of the flesh, they said, again. For instance, fornication that was prevalent at Corinth. And of the spirit, they added, for instance, idolatry. Direct or indirect, whether you literally bow down to uh, idols or you are manipulated by physical things, that you must have this and you must have that and you must do this and you must do that. Physical things dominate your life and they become like a, you know, like an idol. It says the spirit, our spirit now, receives pollution through the flesh. The instrument of uncleanness. And perfecting holiness, in the fear of God it says, the cleansing away of impurity is a positive step towards holiness. It is not enough just to begin. The end, when you put it out, crowns the work. And brethren, this is the guideline by which we should live our lives. So when during the days of unleavened bread we partake of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, we're looking at the life of Christ dwelling in us. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, eats my flesh. I am the bread that came down from heaven. Christ now is going to be living in us. And brethren, eating a leavened bread is not merely taking a little crust in like a piece of a cornflake or maybe uh, the size of what we use in Passover. To eat unleavened bread, it has the, the meaning to fill to the full, to satisfy, to satiate yourself on Christ. So therefore you eat unleavened bread as a meal in itself, not a little piece. And then you eat a whole lot of other stuff and you just take the little piece. But that at least once during the days of unleavened bread, the unleavened bread must be the main part of your meal. Because then you are putting on Christ. And as he says, he who eats me shall live by me. So we eat unleavened bread, brethren, for those seven days. Because seven is a, a, a symbol of completeness, of perfection, and the intent of God from way back before the universe began was that we should be holy and blame without blame in him. And he made that possible through Christ. And therefore, this is the, the guideline by which we should live our lives. Because that is the intent God had. And we cannot allow ourselves to come short of what he expects of us.